This video is sponsored by Cheddar. Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Today, I'm facing one of my greatest fears. What happens when I run out of scales to talk about? I mean, there's only so many ways to arrange 12 notes, and only a fraction of them have ever been used for anything particularly noteworthy. So eventually, that well's gonna run dry. What do I do then? I mean, I could just stop talking about scales, but that's no fun, so instead I'm embracing one of YouTube's oldest formats, the challenge video. I'm daring myself to analyze a completely random scale just to see if I can do it. Let's go. Okay, so first things first, we need a scale, and for this I'm turning to one of my favorite websites, A Study of Scales, maintained by composer and theorist Ian Ring. It's a sorted list of every possible combination of the 12 standard notes of a piano, and each one has its own page with lots of great information about the properties of that scale. I use it all the time for all sorts of reasons, but right now the most important thing is that it's fairly meticulous about including names for the scales that have them, which means it's a good way to check for ones that don't. So what I'm gonna do is generate random 7-note scales until I find one without a name, and... Yikes. Okay, let's do this. The first thing that catches my eye here is that the notes are really clustered towards the bottom. Like, if we go from the root to the fifth note, that interval is actually a perfect fourth. We've got five notes crammed into the bottom half of the scale, leaving just two for the top. It's like the scale starts out slowly, moving mostly by half steps, then suddenly realizes it's running out of notes and just sprints the rest of the way up. But that's just the general shape. The next thing I want to look at are the melodic features. That is, when we're writing melodies in this scale, which parts are going to demand the most attention? And the first thing that stands out to me is this leap from the fifth note to the sixth. The two are right next to each other in the scale, but they're also a minor third apart. It's a built-in jump that any melodies you write will have to contend with. Of course, it's not the only scale that does this. Probably the most well-known example is harmonic minor which has a similar leap between the 6th and 7th notes. This jump makes the scale a bit harder to work with, but it also adds some extra character and a more unique sound. The other important feature, I think, is at the beginning of the scale, where we start off with two consecutive half-steps. This is pretty rare. The best example I can think of is the blues scale, where there's an extra passing note inserted in between the 4th and the 5th. These sorts of consecutive half-steps kind of break a lot of our models for how scales work, and this one's no exception. It almost feels like our scale has two different seconds, a flat one and a natural one. Moving up and down through that section feels very restrained, which creates a great contrast with that forced leap higher up in the scale. But enough about melodies, let's move on to my one true love chords. Now, the normal way to harmonize a scale is to stack alternating sets of notes, like the root 3rd and 5th, or 2nd, 4th, and 6th, and if we do that here, it's a mess. It's a complete, utter mess. We've got a flat 2 minor here, which is nice, and if we look closely we can pick out a 3 augmented and a flat 7 diminished for whatever that's worth, but most of these aren't really chords at all. I mean, technically they are, but they have no recognizable quality. And that's Fine. Walking up and down the scale like this creates an interesting dreamlike effect as the various dissonant note bundles slide into each other without any real resolution, but it'd be hard to create a strong, coherent progression out of it. As we mentioned earlier, though, this scale doesn't really work like a normal scale because it has both a flat second and a natural one. If we adjust our chords to compensate for that, we get this... Which... Honestly, I think sounds worse as a walk-up, but it gives us some real chord qualities to work with if we want to create a sense of harmonic motion. We can also see some flexibility. The flat 7 chord, for instance, can be major or minor, depending on which of the seconds we decide to use with it, and our flat 2 chord, which was minor in the last version, has become major. There's some interesting options developing here. It's still not great, though, because the scale has another issue. It's only got three perfect fifths. This one, this one, and this one. Most of our more stable chord qualities need that perfect fifth to hold them together, which is why the major scale has a whopping six of them, but here we've got just half that, which means we can't build stable triads from most of the notes in our scale, including the root. This seems like a big problem, and it is, but we can solve it with some help from one of chord theory's most overlooked tools, the dyad. This is like a triad, except instead of using three notes, we only use two, so we can create harmony without needing a fifth at all. For instance, if I play C sharp and F together, you get the feeling of a major chord, even though the scale has no G-sharp to complete it. And while stable triads are hard to find, stable dyads are pretty simple. We just need to grab any two notes that are some kind of third apart and let the listener's ear fill in the perfect fifth that we don't actually have access to. This is especially useful in creating a sense of resolution on the one chord. Normally, the best we could make is one augmented, but a one major dyad feels much more restful. Still, it's probably best used for more impressionistic, non-directional stuff. There's one other potential use for the scale, though, because 
because it has two very important notes, a major third and a minor seventh. These, along with a root, form the shell of a dominant seventh chord, which means this can be used as what's called a dominant scale. This is a kind of chord scale, which is a scale that you play over a specific chord in a progression, and since dominant sevenths are the primary drivers of tension in traditional Western music, the scales we use over them are often the most interesting. In fact, this scale resembles another common dominant scale called altered, but with a couple notes lowered even further. Honestly, this is probably the best use of this scale. Next time you're soloing and the band hits a dominant seventh, maybe try playing this for a bit and see what happens. Anyway, that's my observations on this random nameless scale, but at this point, I feel like it'd be weird for it to remain nameless. After all, we name scales once someone does something with them, and I think this video counts as something, so I feel like I should give this thing a proper name. I could name it after myself, but I think calling it the 12-tone scale is probably more confusing than it's worth, so instead I'll call it the elephant scale after my favorite favorite cartoon animals. Before we finish though, I'm sure some of you are wondering what it actually sounds like in a piece of music. Normally I don't bother including compositions because you can just look up what other artists have done with it, but since as far as I know no one has ever written anything with this scale before, here's a short 4 bar piece I wrote to test out what it could do. A lot of the harmony is those dyads I was talking about, and I made sure to include the important melodic features I mentioned so you could hear them in action. I think at this point in the challenge video format I'm supposed to tag other people to try it too, but instead of that, I'll turn it over to y'all. Write some music with the elephant scale, and if you come up with something you like, post it in the comments or send it to me through email or Twitter. I can't wait to see what you come up with. But you know who I am gonna tag? This video's sponsor, Cheddar. Cheddar is a new YouTube channel about technology, media, and news without all the boring bits. They recently made an awesome video about the race to Mars that I'd really recommend. There's a link in the description. They've got lots of other great videos too, covering topics like WrestleMania, the Bermuda Triangle, and the misguided war on solitaire, so if you like what you see, check out the rest of the channel and don't forget to subscribe. Plus, as a bonus, they've been sponsoring lots of other great educators too, which really helps the entire educational video community thrive. So thanks, Cheddar. Oh, and thanks for watching, and thanks to our Patreon patrons for supporting us and making these videos possible. If you want to help out and get some sweet perks like sneak peeks of upcoming episodes, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.